Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Wherever you are in the world, we send you our warmest greetings from the Jerusalem Fund, and we hope that you're enjoying this lovely spring season that we're having. So today is our much anticipated Hisham Sarabi Memorial Lecture. Um, as many of you may know, it's one of our most loved annual events here at the Jerusalem Fund. And we are so pleased and honored to be hosting Professor Lawrence Davidson. He himself was a student of Hisham Sharabi in the past, and he will tell us a little bit more about that today during his talk. Uh, Dr. Davidson has been a professor of Middle East history at Westchester University in Pennsylvania for 27 years. He is an author. He has traveled widely throughout the Middle East and has met many principal leaders involved in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and maintains his own <laughs> blog currently, thepointanalysis.com. And he continues to advocate for Palestinian rights and independence today. And our main moderator is our very own Saeed Arakat, journalist, analyst, columnist. And uh, we are excited to be having this talk today uh, about this lecture, which will cover 1917 and imperialism through the 1940s and the Zionist movement and the situation with Palestinians today and where Dr. Davidson sees the future may be going. So I will hand it off to Saeed. Future may be going. So I will hand it off to Saeed. Uh, thank you, Rukhaya. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. We are really uh, honored to have you speak at the very important event. Uh, as Rukhaya mentioned, it's one of our you know, uh, landmark events uh, throughout the year. So uh, we take a great deal of pride uh, in this event in the memory of Dr. Sharabi, whom you've known for a very long, or whom you knew for a, a long, long time. Um, and we're going to uh, listen to your presentation, then we are going to open um, uh, the, the floor, for, uh, the virtual floor uh, for participants to send in their questions. I will post some questions to you uh, in, the, in the beginning and go on. And on this very, very important subject, a great deal of people, a great many people tend to forget the roots uh, of this issue and, uh, tend, and that tends to, uh, in many ways, to camouflage uh, the, the, the essence of the struggle. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Davidson, we turn it to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the uh, Jerusalem Fund for inviting me um, to present this year's Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture. It's an honor uh, to do so. I'd like to say a few words about Hisham. Um, whom I knew for over 20 years. <clears throat> I met him while I was in, at Georgetown University. This was in the late 1960s, 67 through 70. And that was a very tumultuous time. The Vietnam War was ongoing. Uh, there was uh, great uh, tension flowing from civil rights movement, et cetera. And so, uh, I was, within that context, I was quite the radical. Um, I was a member of the leftist youth movement known as SDS or Students for a Democratic Society. <clears throat> and, and we led protests, organized uh, you know, large amounts of people coming into Washington or helped uh, organize that. Um, and so, um, we were on the FBI's list of to watch list and all of that kind of stuff. Hisham was fascinated with um, the ra radicals in Washington, DC. Now maybe he identified with us because he had uh, in his own youth been somewhat of a radical. Um, or maybe he saw us somehow in connection with uh, um, the Palestinian movement because at that point in the late 60s, most people in the SDS were, were 
cognizant of the Palestinian uh, movement and supportive of it. That would change in the early 70s, but that was the situation in the 60s. So Hisham was very much fascinated with us. He would attend, occasionally attend our meetings um, and, uh, and be very interested in what we were doing and why and et cetera, okay? <clears throat> it is through Hisham that I came to understand the Palestinian plight. I mean, I must tell you that I, I, I am an anti-Zionist Jew, one of those self-hating Jews, you know, um, as, they, uh, as they say. Uh, and I've been that way since I was 18. I mean, I'm very consistent. Um, and so in my 20s, as an anti-Zionist Jew, um, I met Hisham, I learned about the Palestinians. I actually published some of my early articles in the early uh, numbers of the Journal of Palestine Studies. So, you, you know, if you want to dig up all that kind of stuff, you can find me there. Um, <clears throat> And so I actually went in 1968, I think it was, uh, and I visited Hisham in Lebanon. He was in, he was in Beirut, uh, where, uh, <clears throat> where he had uh, offices. And through him, I met many of the Palestinian fighters who were um, sort of in Beirut at that moment. Um, I met Leila Khalid uh, at that point, I, I, I remember. Um, subsequently, I actually met Yasser Arafat um, and some of those close around him in what was then a half-destroyed uh, headquarters in Ramallah. So it was really a, a wild ride for a 25, 26-year-old kid and I was a kid, um, <clears throat> and Hisham showed the way. So um, I remember him quite fondly uh, and kind of miss him actually. <clears throat> so let's proceed now to my prepared talk. Title of this is, <clears throat> As Go the Palestinian, So Goes the World. Um, it's a relatively complicated and 50 minutes long story. Um, so I'll ask your patience for while I tell this story, for much of it has to do with the colonization process that was very popular, very accepted prior to World War II. And then it's, <clears throat> it's losing its luster. And we go into a period of decolonization after World War II. And then a surprise a movement into an environment that will allow coloniz colonization, imperialism and colonization again. And much of that has to do with Israel, okay? So <clears throat> here it goes. Let's start in with 1917, okay? Um, if you look at the state of the world affairs in 1917, the uh, international political scene, um, you'll find that both imperialism and colon col colonialism are quite accepted. In fact, they're not even, they're not, question, nobody actually, except very few people, think about it. Um, they're that common and that accepted. The Balfour Declaration itself is a document um, that flows from this uh, colonial uh, um, way of seeing things and, uh, and acceptable immediately. Uh, it's an acceptable <clears throat> um, outline for British policy. And this is kind of uh, kind of uh, 
funny, I mean, what the British are doing at this time with the Balfour Declaration <coughs> is they're promising a third party. And that third party is the World Zionist Organization. They're promising them lands that they don't have. They don't control. Uh, under modern, uh, modern descriptions of this process, it, it would be called a scam, actually. Um, and these lands were part of another imperium, another empire, and this the Ottoman Empire. The reason that this was permissible <clears throat> is that things were in flux, okay? With World War I going on, empires were contracting, expanding, and uh, the British had a list of territories which they hoped to conquer and occupy, and Palestine was on that list. So, you know, they were essentially saying, trust us, we're going to take these lands, and so we promise them to you, but pro presently we don't own it, you know. Um, <clears throat> and all of this was reinforced <clears throat> by a belief that, a popular belief now, um, that national greatness was a function of conquest, subjugation, uh, and sometimes colonization, as with the French. The French took Algeria in 1830, and they had been slipping people in there, convicts uh, and others, uh, since then, okay? Now, here's another point that I want you to keep in mind while we're in this 1917 <clears throat> uh, imperialism, col colonialism is okay kind of era. And the other point is to keep in mind is um, a really important one. At this time, a sovereign state, if you're a sovereign state, you're looking at a sovereign state, it meant that the, the authorities within that state could do anything they can, they wanted to, good or bad, within their borders, within their territory, and no state would intervene. <clears throat> no other state would intervene. Um, <clears throat> and there would be no, and there were no international laws to judge what a state did within its own borders. That's what sovereign meant. Okay, a good example of this is the, at the time, World War I, is the fate of the Armenians in the Ottoman, in Ottoman Turkey. Many people decried the near genocidal um, treatment of the Armenians, but it was to no avail. No state would intervene. <clears throat> Now that doesn't mean that there were the British didn't say, "Oh, the uh, tut tut, that was that's really bad," or, or something like that, or use it for propaganda purposes against the Turks. However, no state would intervene for that purpose uh, to save the Armenians. I mean, they might intervene to conquer the place, conquer the uh, Turks, but the Armenian plight would never be a motive. And that's because the, the Turks were a sovereign, sovereign state. <clears throat> and within their borders, they could, in principle, do anything they want. Keep that in mind when we come to the practice uh, of the Israelis in, in the context of, of the Palestinian plight. <clears throat> because that's coming back after after a while, okay, this notion of sovereignty. <clears throat> and again, <clears throat> Western populations saw nothing wrong with this. Not, it, ethically or morally, they didn't see anything wrong with the, with the sovereign prevention of intervention. Obviously, they would. There was judgments made on how the Turks were behaving, but nobody saw anything wrong with the fact that you couldn't go in and and, and change things. Okay. <clears throat> Thus, you could proceed 
uh, great powers could proceed uh, to control foreign lands and do what they want. As Edward Said put it, um, in flat disregard of both the presence and wishes of the native majority population, unquote. The assumption was that the natives didn't know what was good for them. And that Western imperialism spread civil progress and civilization. Now it's interesting in April of 1921, Winston Churchill, who was uh, at that time <clears throat> uh, active in the British Foreign Service, came to Palestine in 19, April 1921. And he met with a, with a delegation in Jerusalem. And what did he tell them? He said that Zionism would enrich Palestine and that they would prosper, okay? They would share in that progress that Zionism would bring. Churchill has in mind, and he was completely you know, honest. I mean, he believed all this. Churchill had in mind the old idea that rising tides float all boats. Um, so he assumed that Zionism comes in, makes the place Palestine more modern, um, uh, brings in a lot of uh, wealth, and the Arabs would share in that. However, I mean, this is very a completely naive idea Right? Did Churchill not know what the Zionists aimed at? I mean, did they, they not know that they were, uh, that they had this sort of bias against the Palestinians? Apparently not. He's a lot like President Biden today. You know, he, Churchill was a self -pro professed Zionist. And he seemed to either ignore or be willingly ignorant of the real nature and ruthlessness of this of, of this process of the of the Zionist aims and what they're willing to do to get them. Now, one notable fact about the Jews who were initially coming into Palestine in the in this time in the twenties and thirties. Um, they are Europeans, okay? Now, they might have been widely discriminated against in Europe, but they're assimilated enough to be culturally identified with the West and with uh, European uh, biases, okay? <clears throat> so despite their outsider status in Europe, they're going when they come to Palestine, they're going to see themselves as culturally European and therefore civilizationally superior. Okay. Um, and so they're going to identify themselves with the West and they're going to identify the Palestinians as a non European, second class uh, uh, citizens and uh, not even citizens, uh, peoples who are uh, lack progress, lack, lack civilization, and such a, and such. Um, so <clears throat> the Jews took up the promise of the Balfour Declaration, threw off their second class status proceeded to Palestine, threw off their second class status because now, they, now they're the ones who are European and civilized and et cetera, and essentially um, forced onto the Palestinians the degraded status that the Jews had discarded. Now that's a weird way of looking at it, but, you, but in, in psychologically you could see that the, the Jews that came into Palestine were the degraded people, but not now, not now. They had threw, thrown off that status and they just passed it on to the people uh, over which they now ruled. 
And this created an enormous um, hubris, chutzpah, if you want to put it that way. <clears throat> I'll give you an example of this. Um, <clears throat> Chaim Weitzman, who is the leader of the World Zionist Organization, he's the same guy who Balfour promised a home in Palestine. This is 1943 now. Weitzman has an appointment, uh, an interview, a meeting with the United States Department, the, U, uh, the State Department, the foreign policy guys, the United States State Department Division of Near Eastern Affairs, okay? And so he goes there in 1943. He meets with these guys. And what does he tell them? He says, look, Palestine could, can never be an Arab land again. That's it. It's a categorical statement, okay? Well, the people in the Near East Division thought that Weitzman was just exaggerating or, you know, expressing his own hubris. <clears throat> Within five years of that date, the fledgling Zionist organization um, that was being built up, a lobby that is now starting to be built up, in Washington, within five years, it uses its influence with Truman, President Truman, to get the people who are anti-Zionist within that Near East Division re either forcibly retired or, or transferred someplace else. Principally, India is where they sent them. But they got them out. Okay. All right. Now, let's move. Let's things things go flip now. Now let's step forward um, to 1945. It's in 1945, 48, 49 into the early 50s. Okay. What we find is a radical, radical difference, a radical change. <clears throat> and in, that is in term principally in terms of how people look at imperialism and colonialism. And the reason that this radical change takes place is the Nazis, okay? Nazi atrocities scared the pants off of everyone or almost everyone, okay? Now remember the, that issue of sovereignty. If the Nazis had stayed, uh, their operations kept their operations within the German borders. They could have proceeded, like Chan the, Hitler as the chancellor of Germany could have murdered every single Jew, communist, gypsy, disabled person, the whole list of victims. He could have done it all as long as he stayed in Germany. That's what sovereignty meant. Nobody was going to cross that border and intervene in another sovereign state. The, they, they wouldn't do it because they didn't want to set the precedent. <clears throat> but Hitler wanted an empire. Hitler wanted an, to be imperialist and, colon, and, colon, and he wanted to be a colonist. He wanted to take all that... Um, Eastern territory, and he claimed he needed living space, and he wanted to put German colonies out there, etc. He wanted to essentially do in Europe what the Europeans were doing in Africa, or in India, or elsewhere. In other words, what Hitler had done is take the techniques uh, and, the, and the emotional uh, prejudices that allowed for imperialism in the third world and brought it back to Europe. So, you know, if 
you've got German troops in Paris and some Parisian turns around and says to a German officer, you know, we're, you know, we've got a great civilization here in France. The German officer would say you're inferior. And that's why we we're here. And so we're going to exploit you and your resources just like any other colony. So that's what Hitler did. And it scared the Europeans. It really did shake them up. And obviously Hitler didn't stay in his own borders. He crossed the border into Poland and then he crossed a whole lot of other borders. And that, at that point, Europe went to war and all bets are off, okay? In terms of German sovereignty now. So as a consequence of World War II and the horrors of the Nazis, imperialism and colonialism lost their luster in the post-war era. Um, and by the time the war ended, you'll see leaders of the European uh, nations, not all, but many of them, start to think in terms of decolonization. And the example here, the best example here, is the British Empire. <clears throat> this is amazing what happened with the British Empire and the, where the sun never sets. Huh? They converted their empire into a commonwealth. You know? And that essentially freed all of these uh, inherent countries within the, the British Empire dozens of now independent countries come out of that. And one of the other things that they did, which is you can see in, in the European Union today even, they allowed for free labor movement within the Commonwealth. What does this do? It transforms Great Britain into a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society. If you go to England today, you're gonna to see a lot of people who look very much Jamaican rather than, than uh, British and they're gonna speak with a, a very uh, uh, recognizable British accent. They've been born and educated there. It's a multiracial, multi-ethnic country now. An amazing transformation. After all, Indian food is the official national or unofficial national cuisine of England. So yeah, uh, th this is the result. And even the United States uh, over time, um, by 1946, the United States is giving, is granting independence to the Philippines, in case you never knew that the Philippines was an American colony. Um, it wasn't all very easy, of course. The French resisted um, and ended up fighting wars in Vietnam and Algeria. It was a bloody mess. However, the movement, the general movement was towards decolonization and being anti-imperialist and that sort of thing, okay? Even more so in this period, and this is just as uh, this is even more important from for our purposes is that during this period you get treaties and universal declarations drawn up outlawing the behavior of the nazis <clears throat> genocide is meant is made outlawed is outlawed and eventually made a crime against humanity the fourth geneva convention comes about to deal with humanitarian protections for civilians in a war zone, obviously this is theory, not practice. You can see it in, you, in the Ukraine. Um, you get internet, the International Court of Justice at The Hague, which was now is now compl complemented by the International Criminal Court. Finally, there's a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is passed by the General Assembly in the UN. <clears throat> this is Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt's uh, grand achievement. 
uh, she says it represents a great event in the life of human of mankind. Um, and she says it guarantees, among other things, the right of every individual to live their lives freely, equally, and in dignity. Obviously, Eleanor was overly optimistic about this, but it points in the right direction, okay? What you've got here, if you total up the treaties, the declarations, the conventions, the court of justice, the whole, the whole uh, Megillah, as you say, the whole business, um, what you have here is a new set of standards. Uh, a new set of standards for a more civilized behavior, okay? And if these standards prevailed, if you, and obviously, you know, it's a struggle. You can see how um, the struggle goes on in terms of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, you know, try, trying to uh, get the Israelis before the ICC is like, you know, it's very difficult. And so <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a struggle to get, to move the world in the direction of these new standards that come out uh, after the Second World War. However, it's a struggle in the right direction, I, I guess we can say, okay? Anyway, <clears throat> If these standards prevail, the result also, and this is, a, this is a problem, the result also would be restraints on sovereignty, okay? What we got here is rules telling nations what they can and cannot do within and without their borders, all right? You can't kill off minority parts of your population. Genocide is illegal, okay? You can't institute apartheid. In 1966, apartheid is made a crime against humanity, okay? You can't do that. At least that's what the law says, right? Now, what happens if these, these laws prevail? It means that sovereignty is loosened up. It doesn't mean the absolute thing it did uh, before uh, the Second World War. <clears throat> and you can see, I mean, there is this sort of, this uh, egalitarian uh, impulse. I mean, it, it's spotty, but, you know, you see 1994, it's still there. Um, when civil society organizations, along with governments, uh, eventually governments and corporations, forced, a part, forced the South African white government to end apartheid. So that's the pressure from without amongst people who have taken the lessons of the Second World War and the Nazis and transform those lessons into, from theory into practice, okay? All right, so here we are, again, between 1948 and 1950, say, <clears throat> or 45, between 45 and 50, and everybody's thinking in terms of, oh, we're gonna decolonize, and we're going to institute all these uh, humane laws and uh, principles. And within this environment, there's a flaw. There's a, a problem here. There's a contradiction. And that is within the same environment, the state of Israel is, is, uh, comes about, okay? Now, the state of Israel's uh, birth is a contradiction. It's a, 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 col a colonist, colonial, is, I'm sorry. It's a colonial act, okay? And so as a colonial act, 
it's a contradiction to the spirit of decolonization. Okay, though I'm, I'm afraid that in 1948, nobody noticed this but the Arab states. <laughs> so in Europe, they didn't notice this con contradiction, okay? And the, Israel and the G Zionists, rather, were going all around saying, oh, you know, uh, the Jews are a deprived people who should have their own, uh, own land and they, that sort of thing. Okay, they're trying to identify themselves, the Zionists, trying to identify themselves with the countries in the third world that essentially are being uh, allowed to ha uh, come about uh, their own national, um, their own national character, their own nations and stuff like that. So the Zionists are trying to fit themselves into that, that genre. In fact, they're a contradiction. They're a straight out colonial um, imposition um, within uh, the Middle East. Now, <clears throat> here's another question. <clears throat> okay, so the it, Israel is uh, it's established. Uh, nobody seems to notice, but the Arab states that there's a contradiction here. What are the developmental choices? that the Zionists have in 1948, say. Um, could they have <clears throat> um, followed the spirit of the time, which you know flowed from an optimistic hope that uh, the you know, universal declaration of rights and uh, and and uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention and this this sort of thing are, are going to set a better standard for international behavior. Behavior, are they? Can they follow that impulse? Can they be? Can they develop themselves in a progressive progressive way? Um, okay. All right. That's one thing. Um, however, the answer is no. They, I mean, the answer is, even if they wanted to, it wouldn't have worked out that way. Okay. <clears throat> the problem is that by, you know, by, how shall I put this? The problem is that um, if you take uh, a, a group of Europeans and impose them on a land where there's a million non-Europeans. And if the, those Europeans have in mind, their goal is an exclusive state, there's no way. There's no way this can be done without disruption and violence and resistance, okay? And so um, the, 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 the Zionists are essentially stuck. Not that they feel stuck, they know what they want to do, but the possibility of their carrying over, okay, the, um, the progress and the, and the positive uh, feelings and, uh, and intentions that come after the war, they can't do it, okay? In fact, what they're going to do is follow the exact opposite path, all right? So while we have get lots of uh, freedom in terms of uh, independence and, and that sort of thing, and you know, uh, feeling that we're not going to uh, impose uh, ourselves on the natives anymore. They're going in the opposite direction, okay? And in fact, what they represent is a danger, okay? Is a danger to, um, to this impulse, right? In fact, they will make repeated attacks 
on um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Fourth Geneva Convention. They'll do this, the way they'll do this is simply by ignoring those, those laws and acting against them. And they'll never be held responsible for that. And when you do that over and over and over again, you erode those laws. Okay? And essentially what the Israelis will represent <clears throat> for the other great powers who might have did not want their sovereignty to be uh, restricted, the is what Israel comes to represent is that state authority has precedence over international law. So if a state wants to do something, their right to do it within their own borders takes precedence over international law. That's what the Israelis represent. Okay. <clears throat> Now, let's take a look at um, what the Palestinians are doing here in the post-1948 era. They are obviously resisting. They are resisting colonialism, okay? And how is their resistance seen in the West? It's seen as terrorism, okay? And sometimes, obviously, they do use terrorism. I mean, when somebody crawls into a bus and blows it up, it's terrorism, whoever does it, no matter who does it. However, generally speaking, the Palestinian resistance is not, quote, quote terroristic, unquote, okay? And keep in mind this, that as a general principle, the tactics of the oppressor, of the oppressor, creates a model for the tactics of the oppressed. There is a certain um, uh, connection, can't think of the word. Um, there's a certain connection that where one essentially feeds on the other, all right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> the occasional disproportionate, uh, the occasional um, terrorism or acts of terrorism, which are atypical, but they are a response when they come, the response to the acts of a disproportionate revenge carried out by the Israelis in response to early, earlier cross-border movements by the Palestinians. Also, the great uh, advantage in weaponry um, makes it impossible for the Palestinians to engage in a classic, classical guerrilla war, okay? And this then led to the occasional uh, terrorist act. And I said it's a, it was atypical. And nonetheless, in reality, what the Palestinian fight, Palestinians are fighting for besides a state of their own, <clears throat> was and is racial, ethnic, religious freedom under the rule of law, okay? That's what the Palestinians really want. Um, it's the same things as postulated in the post-World War II treaties and declarations so that you can identify the Palestinian fight um, with these very same hopes for a more progressive world, okay? The two, the two milled, okay? Particularly since um, the Palestinians are put in a position where violence only brings greater violence down on them. So they've got to think of how to manipulate within that society, that situation. 
Okay. So <laughs> while the Palestinians come to represent a new and better um, behaved international uh, community, the Israelis, through their persecution of the Palestinians, take a definitive stand against that better future. See? And this is ongoing, okay? My, my think, my feeling, my, uh, my belief <clears throat> is that the Zionist project <clears throat> desires to move the world backward so that past colonialist and racist practices once more become acceptable. If that can happen, they can be deemed a normal country. But only if that happens, see? The Palestinians say they want equal rights. The Israelis, maintain that racist notion of civilizational superiority. And so how can the Israelis become accepted internationally as a normal state? It's only by taking the world backwards, okay? Um, not only in terms of you know, making colonial and racist practices acceptable again, but also by telling the great powers that sovereignty should once again mean that rulers can do anything they want within their own borders. And that's exactly what the Israelis are doing within the occupied territories. They're saying, hey, this is our sovereign, part of our sovereign um, territory, and, and you can't, you sh can't tell us what to do here. Okay, that's what they're doing. And the disgusting truth is they're getting away with it. Okay, in the West, the governments and diplomatic bureaucracies are either mute to what the Israelis be, uh, are doing, or they're actively supporting it. Okay, holding Israel free of any accountability sets a precedent, as I said, signaling the predominance of, this, of state power over international law. So they're, dis they're attempting to destroy all of the progress, the potential progress that comes after the Second World War, okay? And I'll give you an example of how they're being, how they're getting away with this. Amnesty International <coughs> wrote a report on uh, Israeli uh, apartheid. That report was definitive. And what I mean by definitive is it was so well documented and, you know, went into all the details that it would be very, very hard, almost impossible to argue against all of this evidence. So <clears throat> uh, at, a, at a, a press conference um, with the US, uh, with the spokesman, you know, the press spokesman of the US, of the US State Department was asked about the, the uh, amnesty report. Now he's not going to challenge the evidence. <clears throat> he says, we reject it. Why do you reject it? Because what that report is trying to do is disallow Israelis from, ha from having self-determination. Okay, there, there must be a, a, a Jewish state, that Jewish state must have self-determination. And if you, you know, you uh, charge it with apartheid, 
what that does is is make that self-determination less effective. So what he's arguing is <clears throat> that if you've got a sovereign state, self-determination involves the, uh, the right to do whatever you want within that th your borders. And if you come and challenge that and say, no, 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 you can't, do just anything you want. Apartheid is a crime against humanity, et cetera, et cetera. That takes away the state's, the, the population of that state's ability to assert self-determination. And that was the argument. And so, um, you know, obviously it's a very unethical argument. Uh, it's a dangerous argument. What it implies is that um, it's acceptable for a state, be it Jews, Jewish or any other state, to be racist in practice if that's what, where their self-determination takes them. See? And so this is in stark violation of international law. But that's the point. There should be no international law, according to the Israelis and those who support them there should be no international law because it takes away sovereignty, it takes away self-determination, okay? So that's where you, we're an example of where we're going, okay? <clears throat> it's hard for the common citizen to see all this, okay? Common citizen is in what? Involved in very local, personal kinds of activities. He lives, uh, again, not knowing what's on the other side of the hill often until it comes across and hits him in the head, you know. So um, it's not easy to, to popularize the, this and explain what's going on, okay? <clears throat> Nonetheless, there's a seminal struggle going on a very important ongoing struggle. And the struggle is how is the international community to, to proceed into the future? Is it to be self-disciplined um, in a fashion that honors international law or is it to be unrestricted in, in a fashion that allows for them to states to disregard international law and also disregard all the past lessons that were, we were supposed to have learned um, from the World War II experience with the Nazis, etc. And of course, the fate of Palestinians is right in the middle of this seminal battle, okay? Today, Palestinian resistance, is, it, having gone through many stages, it is in a sort of passive status. That is, there's no new intifada yet. Um, there's isolated uh, violent uh, acts at, out of frustration um, with apparently very little organization. So we can judge the present moment as relatively passive. But importantly, the Palestinians have made alliances, okay? And here in the West, it's principally through BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. That movement ha has drawn to it hundreds, hundreds of civil society organizations in the United States, in Europe, in South America. This, when it comes to civil rights movements, okay, the Palestinian rights, Palestinian rights is a prominent, prominent part of, of uh, essentially hundreds of civil society movements, okay? 
That alliance keeps alive the Palestinian cause, all right? Makes it international in a true way. And therefore the potential of that cause, the hope of that cause still maintains itself through these alliances. Um, there might come a day when there's new intifada and, and things get reoriented back towards Palestine proper, but in the present, it's these alliances that keep alive um, the Palestinian cause, okay? And I must say at this point that Isham Shurabi did a lot of work, um, foundational work to build civil society support for the Palestinians here in the United States, okay? All right, and this is why, I guess, um, this is why I've entitled this paper, uh, As Go the Palestinians, So Go the World, because if we can, in, in fact, win this battle and make inter international law a real force, the Palestinians will win. If we can't, they won't win. And none of us will win either. Uh, if we don't win this struggle, no minority can ever say that they're really safe again. And so as go the Palestinians, so go the world. Thank you. Ever say that they're really safe again. And so as go the Palestinians, so go the world. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davidson, for really such a, an enlightening and uh, presentation that is so steeped in history uh, and that can really uh, explain the roots uh, of this thing. I mean, yeah, you mentioned Winston Churchill, the quintessential colonist, you know, uh, lying to the Palestinians in their face, knowing that there's no way they can be enriched or their lot can be improved when in fact, what, you know, the future holds is stealing their land. You know, 95% of Palestinians were peasants. They depended and lived uh, uh, on the land. What really is mind boggling and maybe something that you will address uh, is how consistently the British bend towards, you know, the Palestinians, towards the state of Israel. I mean, in recent years, I have posed the question uh, to British uh, officials, you know, from Tony Blair to Jack Straw, I mean, I myself and others, if they have a little bit of guilt about what, you know, they feel <clears throat> anything, you know, and in fact, they don't. I mean, we see uh, that a uh, hundred years, uh, you know, after the Belfort Declaration, a hundred and four years uh, since, you know, uh, uh, since the, the end, uh, literally the, uh, 103 years since the end, uh, three years since the end of World War I, there is not one more, you know, movement. There is not a, a single movement um, uh, made by the British to say, we screwed up, you know, we should be held responsible somehow. We hold the principle of sovereignty. We, you know, we want to remedy that. We should advocate uh, for at least what we promised uh, and so on back in the Belfort Declaration. So I am saying that this policy yeah, is yeah. consistent with Western supremacy. And in fact, we see it today with what's happening in Ukraine. We see it with what's happening in Ukraine. Imagine for a moment if the United States took you know, the moral high ground as it claims with Ukraine, with the Palestinians and, and poured that kind of weapon, poured that yeah. kind of aid and so on. It, that is still going on. The hypocrisy and, is. Yeah, I mean, so, so the, the Americans keep saying, you know, Israel is a sovereign state, as you suggested, and sovereignty means apparently to them that you know that the the uh, the area is occupied and so on. Although they do pay lip service from time to time as this is being occupied and so on. So um, the, uh, such uh, rich and fascinating topics that has so many you know details and tentacles and so on uh, uh, to, to to pursue a discussion uh, over. But I want to ask you you know, the, an issue that keeps coming up, uh, one, you know, uh, or raised, had it not been for 
uh, World War II and uh, the horrific genocidal atrocities uh, of the Holocaust and, and the Nazis and so on. How would that, I mean, if we can imagine, of course, you know, we cannot uh, imagine um, uh, a situation where the world, uh, the, the war did not erupt or, you know, uh, as yeah. you suggested, you know, if maybe maybe the, the, the West uh, would have looked the other way if uh, uh, Hitler only invaded Poland and, and Russia, maybe, you know, then that, that would be fine. They probably, <laughs> they probably got in some aid and, and so on. But imagining that it did not happen or the, the horrific atrocities, genocidal atrocities of the Holocaust, yeah. did not happen, would that have accelerated, decelerated the creation of the state of Israel? Would it have impacted it in any way, shape or form? No, I think it would, uh, <clears throat> it would have accelerated it. Um, the, the process of colonization that was going on prior to World War II would have continued. Now, there would have been economic and, and geogra geographic limits to the various empires, um, and there would have been frictions between them. Um, but uh, <coughs> Israel would have been created right. and to the frustration yeah, probably at an earlier time probably I, mean, I don't know yeah. to the frustration of the Israelis once, once the state was created they would f have found themselves as part of the British Empire and they didn't <laughs> obviously they did not want to be part of the British Empire and they succeeded not to be, but that was in an environment where colonialism was retreating. And the British citizenry didn't want to be taxed anymore to maintain the empire. Um, if there had been no World War II, the, there would have been a way of supporting the empire simply by expanding it and allowing its own people to ta to be taxed and support the, you know, you tax the peasants, you tax uh, the native population in order to support their own, own occupation, their own, uh, uh, their own subservience. Um, that would have continued. And poor, the poor Israelis would have found themselves, despite themselves, as part of the British Empire. That's what I think, anyway, <laughs> that would go on. Yeah. Yeah, of course, I mean, the, the British keeps insisting what they had in Palestine was a mandate, but it was, of course, colonial. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, this they, is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, is, I forget the, the name of the, uh, of the fellow who uh, was in charge in, in Palestine at one point. Um, and he was interviewed by a newspaper uh, and he said, well, you know, are you going to give up this mandate um, and allow the, the Jews to take over? And he said, no. He said, we've shed a lot of blood taking this territory. And so why shouldn't it be a uh, part of the British Empire? Mm -hmm. So they had no intentions. It, they, they were pushed out. They were pushed out by Arab resistance and Jewish resistance, and the fact that the, that the British population had voted in a labor government, right? And the labor government had said, "All right, we're we're cutting cutting our losses here because we don't we can't tax the British the British people anymore." And then, so they converted everything into a commonwealth. Uh, the uh, Palestine itself, uh, they let go. They just let it go. And uh, then you had this civil war between the Zionists and the, the Palestinians, and history went on. Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, General Wingate, if I'm not wrong, the, the, the person that you mentioned, who actually uh, trained the Haganah and so on to be very brutal with the Palestinians, kill them because he wanted, uh, you know, only Jewish Palestine to be part of that uh, British mandate, as he saw it. You know, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think in, in Palestine <clears throat> during the British occupation, 
what you got was a real division between the local commanders in Palestine uh, who, who just couldn't control the, the Jewish immigrants um, and what was going on in London, right? Because London was very Zionist, pro-Zionist. The local commanders, I don't know about Wingate, but the local commanders um, were not pro-Zionist because the Zionists weren't doing what they want them wanted to, and uh, they were a pain in their ass, and and so uh, you got this division, and so what the the um, um, British did was uh, repeatedly send down um, people who were very pro-Zionist. To in into Palestine as the head, as the commander, right. um, um, either civilian or military, they right. try to uh, make sure those guys were very pro-Zionist, and of course f force the lower echelons and within the military to do what they're ordered to do. Um, but there is there was that division. Now, now, but. Let me go back to where I started with the British. Uh, okay. So this consistency, you know, a consistency of uh, advocating on behalf of colonialism, supporting Israel, denying the Palestinians their rights. I think there is more vigorous uh, enmity towards BDS, let's say, within official circles in, in England. Yeah. Why is that? Why in your perception? Why is that uh, continues to be almost as vigorous as it was? Um, I think that the, uh, <laughs> the Zionists have essentially established within the British parliamentary system the same kind of lobby influence that they've got in Congress, you know, in the U.S. Congress. Um, and so I think, think that they've cultivated um, uh, this, uh, this pro-Zionist um, position among the members of parliament. And occasionally there'll be an odd duck who will be, um, you know, not pro-Zionist and they'll make every effort to get that man uh, or woman uh, out or um, to, uh, you know, defame them as they did with Tony, um, the head of the Labor Party who, who just was uh, kicked at, kicked out essentially? Can't remember his name. I'm having trouble at, at 77 with names. <laughs> so, but uh, he was he was kicked out, um, and he he was Jewish. I think he was Jewish. He called anti-Semitic. Um, maybe he wasn't Jewish, um, but he was labeled anti-Semitic. Now, why did they, why can they do this? Because I think that there there's a very very strong lobby um, uh, operation, very strong um, pro-Zionist uh, element within the uh, British Jewish community, and they've come together, made their alliances, and essentially are able to control the votes, the voting in in Parliament when it comes to this question. I mean, that's what's going on here in, in the United States too. The Zionists um, up to, even now, even with the, the modicum of opposition they're getting, even now, what they've done is essentially create a lobby that's influential enough to control Congress, congressional votes that have that relate to Israel, uh, and so essentially they've made Israeli needs the model or the pattern for um, American foreign policy in the Middle East. They've just controlled it that way. Same thing in England. I wanted to ask you about, of course, the American Jewish community uh, and so on, and how this whole history bears down or impact its presence and future. But I wanted, uh, before then, I wanted to ask you about Truman in particular, because, yeah, yeah. yeah Truman uh, was uh, obviously 
uh, the, the person, the president at the time of the creation of the state of Israel. He was at close ties with the Jewish community. But it is <laughs> also said that he was opposed to creating a Jewish state uh, in, in Palestine. That's no. what he said. And they say that the 1946 midterm election and all that stuff and so on uh, helped a great deal. So just if you could enlighten us. Yeah. This point. It, it, Truman's a really interesting character. Up until Truman's administration, presidents normally would accept the advice of uh, the relevant, um, the relevant uh, congressional or, or, or State Department, yes. Defense Department. If there was an issue, they would take the advice of the relevant uh, group of, uh, of ex experts, okay? Right. Certainly, um, that's what uh, uh, Roosevelt was, was willing to do, certainly after his meeting with uh, the Saudi prince. Anyway, Truman comes in and he says, no, 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 I, there's something wrong here. I'm the boss. The buck stops here, right? right. I'm the boss. And so he's, I'm going to run this like his habit, haberdashery. Uh, right. Before, right. Right. So he it says to the, the Near East Division, you do what I say, okay? Because you're the, I'm the boss. And I'm telling you that for whatever reason, is it maybe it's uh, because I want to be reelected or because, you know, I see myself as a new, uh, as a new prophet or something like, whatever the reason, you do what I say. And when they didn't do it, because that's not what they're used to, they're used to their advice being accepted, um, he just gets rid of them, he fires them as any boss would do. So you've got this very entrepreneurial kind of guy in the presidency and he, he, he essentially turns it around. And every president with possible exception of Eisenhower does the same thing from then on. If you look at the State Department today, okay, what you've got is a middle echelon of people who know their job. These are the people who have the language capacities to read the newspapers of the, uh, their desk officers of the, of the area they're responsible for. They're in touch with the embassies. The embassies are in touch with all the local groups. And so they get that feedback and they write reports as to how things really are in wherever. And then the reports go up the line and at some point they hit a, a political wall. Yes, yeah, because as a, as a frequent of the State Department, as a journalist, I am aware. Yeah, yeah. so they hit this political wall and mm -hmm. if their report is somehow out of skew with the policy that the you know the, the Truman and his and his successors decide they want, the report is ignored. That's well, and that's why, in part, that's why we make so many mistakes. You know. So going back to my question on the American Jewish community, you know, okay. because uh, uh, in the end, I think it's going to carry a great deal of weight on how. The Palestinian struggle, you know, turns out or how, because, yeah. yeah, I mean, let's face it, I don't believe that uh, a majority of Israelis would see themselves, <laughs> you know, even very modestly as equal to the Palestinians or would be willing to, to sort of give up whatever advantages come with, with the supremacy, uh, yeah. you know, and, and so on. So it only... You know, the, the things, the reverberations that we see today, the changes, there is a sea change. You know, some say it's a sea change um, uh, within the American Jewish community. So how do you see that? There's definitely a struggle. That's for sure. Okay. 
I think that uh, most uh, most Jewish synagogues today are still Zionist. Okay, uh, some of them are more active than others. Um, but I think that the attitude is still one of you know attachment to Israel. This, uh, that's most. I think most uh, synagogues are like that. I think that it's it's um, wearing thin. I mean, as the generations turn over, you're getting less and less Jewish youth interested in the issue or, or identifying with Israel in any way. That's why the Israelis are willing to give, the, give anybody, any Jewish youth in this country who wants a free ticket to Israel mm -hmm. and they'll be wined and dined Okay, they'll meet lots of people, no Palestinians, but they'll meet Druze. Okay, and and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. They'll, they'll find friendly Druze to talk to them, um, and um, they'll mistake those Druze for Palestinians, and they'll come back with this wondrous, you know, look in their eye. And of course, the question then is, do they make Aliyah? Do they go? That's the aim. But the, there's a lot of money being put into this effort to keep Jewish youth oriented towards Israel. Uh, I think that it's only working with a minority. So I think over, over time, you'll see less and less of a devotion. I don't know how long it's going to take, though. I mean, but I think that that's that that <clears throat> you've got this struggle, and I think more and more Jewish uh, youth are questioning. I mean, if you look at Jewish Voices for Peace, right, right. I mean, these are these are really non-Zionist Jews, and you've got. I mean, I see people walking around with uh, uh, these t-shirts that say another Jew for Palestine. <laughs> it's yeah. interesting. I was thinking of getting one of those, actually. Um, <clears throat> so I'm kind of optimistic. However, it's a long, long range struggle. That's the problem. And, and uh, how much of Palestine is going to be left um, once this happens? If you could, in your imagination, imagine the U.S. government saying, we're not going to support um, Israel anymore, we're cutting them off financially, um, you might find an Israeli government that was willing to talk to the Palestinians. I don't know how much they'll get, but I mean, they're will they would be willing to talk to them if that happened. Um, but uh, I think it will happen eventually. I just don't know when. I took you very long, but I can't let you go before asking you a couple more questions. Really. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, one, you know, how do we? popularize the struggle for freedom for the Palestinians, ending of appetite and so on, as all the reports have said. I mean, you mentioned the amnesty report that came out in early February and so on. And it's really very clear, very clear on these practices and yeah. so on, although it does hit that brick, the intellectual brick wall of the West and, and, and so on, and doesn't make way. How do we make, uh, you know, the, 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 struggle, <laughs> the Palestinian struggle for freedom, and equality and so on, as popular as it was, you know, uh, uh, toward the end, let's say, of uh, appetite in South Africa. Uh, and then, you know, let me ask you my second question. So we end on that note. Uh, do you see uh, any impact that the current war in Ukraine and all the rhetoric that surrounds it, I mean, especially Western rhetoric, uh, US rhetoric about, you know, the, the, against occupation, against this, impacting the the struggle forward in any way. Yeah, I've seen, well, I've seen comments that say that um, the struggle in, in Ukraine has made 
Americans look at the Palestinian situation more seriously. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who they're Neither talking I. about, <laughs> but yeah. you know, I, I must confess, I don't have an answer to this. You know, um, in my youth, you know, I I was very active in terms of uh, organizing protests and both against the Vietnam War and also for um, uh, Palestine. I, I went about two or three years ago to Australia and you can find um, pictures of me walking up and down in a mall in a mall area saying don't buy you know from this place because they they uh, trade with Israel and that's because I was speaking to uh, people in Australia who I was speaking to the choir essentially and they roped me into going and doing this which is fine but I you know I <clears throat> I don't think, I mean, I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that. I'm not saying that people, when they can, shouldn't organize street corner protests and on-campus protests. That has to be done. However, that's not going to cut it in the end. In the end, what's going to cut it is if hopefully uh, is uh, BDS, you can see... BD, the people that are running BDS, what they're trying to do is not only keep things alive on the campuses, but they're trying to go after economic sources. It's not easy. But that was a part of what was going on against South Africa. And there was a time when people were organizing uh, protests against particular companies trying to force them to face up to what they were doing. And they had no political support at all. Um, but eventually they were able to, you know, to make it work in the government too. Um, it's a little more difficult with the Palestinians and the Israelis because you've got all, you know, you've got this guilt. I don't know why there's still Holocaust guilt. I mean, it's a long time, you know, it's different, different uh, sort of, well, I guess it has to be the next generation for, uh, you know, those who really do feel guilty die out. Um, but uh, you've got a lot of emotional stuff mixed up with Zionism and, and Israel. And so we've got to move on to a hopefully a generation that will find themselves less connected to that uh, before you're going to make any real um, inroads in terms of the government. But now, at least BDS is aiming at these economic targets um, with some minor success. Um, and that sets a precedent for what has to be done in the future. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Davidson. It's been uh, educational and it's been an honor. And uh, it's my honor to have you and, and host you uh, for future events and so on. And sure. with that, I turn you over to my colleague, uh, Rukaya. Okay. I very much enjoyed that talk. So thank you from myself and thank you on behalf of the Jersey fund staff and board. Thank you to our audience for tuning in, uh, those currently live or anybody uh, who would like to watch this video later on. Uh, and please stay in touch with us via email, via our social media for our next upcoming events and for any other questions. Um, and we will see you on our next event.